It's a, with great pleasure that I introduce my friend, uh, Philip Spencer, who um, has been very influential in my own understanding of anti-Semitism. Um, he is now Emeritus Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Kingston University and Visiting Professor in Politics at Birkbeck, London, where he's also an associate of the Pierce Institute for the Study of Antisemitism. He's the author of a, a very interesting book, um, Antisemitism and the Left, The Return of the Jewish Question, uh, together with uh, late Robert Fine. He's also the author of Genocide Since 1945, with R Routledge, 2012, Nationalism, a a uh, Critical Introduction, uh, Sage 2002, um, and Nations and Nationalism um, uh, with Edinburgh University Press 2006, both with um, Howard Wallman. Please join me in welcoming Philip Spencer. So I have to talk about something that is very contemporary, um, something that is ongoing, which is how and why the Labour Party in the United Kingdom which is historically the home for the majority of Jewish voters and activists, has become a space within which anti-Semitic attitudes and views can be easily promoted and circulated. And this is a very troubling phenomenon. Um, in the interest of what we in Britain call full disclosure, uh, I was a member of the Labour Party until quite recently, but I left. And two days ago, my very closest friend also left. So, um, but I do have a lot of friends in it. Uh, so this is a difficult personal question for me. So I want to try and think about this with you and what it means both for the United Kingdom and the left and possibly more globally. How did we get here? Well, we got here primarily because of the election of Jeremy Corbyn to the leadership of the Labour Party which was also a very unexpected event, unexpected to everybody, including to Jeremy Corbyn himself. Um, it happened after the Labour Party had lost two elections in a row, but those two election defeats followed three election victories in a row, which was unprecedented. And those victories were under a very controversial figure, Tony Blair. Um, but the electoral defeats um, were against the backdrop of a kind of despair, really, which was the Conservative government had been elected twice and pursued a vigorous neoliberal policy, austerity policy, which led to a widening of inequality in the country and an attack on the welfare state. So uh, the election of Corbyn was a kind of act of defiance, really, by many people. And I speak here from personal communications. People told me that they voted for Corbyn, not because they thought he was any good, but because they were just fed up. And it was an act of defiance. If we're going to lose, and we're going to lose, and we keep losing, let's have somebody we agree with instead of somebody we don't really like very much. Um, so it was a very odd mood. But it was facilitated by an extraordinary decision, uh, which I've been pondering of late, what the meaning of this is, more deeply. And that was a decision by the previous Labour Party leader who just resigned to open up the election of a leader to people who weren't members of the Labour Party. You could spend three pounds and become a member of the Labour Party to vote for the new leader. You didn't have to have been a member of the Labour Party, and you could leave the Labour Party afterwards, but you could elect the new leader. This was completely new. So it meant that lots of people suddenly spent three pounds, and I met a lot of people, and I come myself from a far left background, who spent, this is great, we can spend three pounds, we can elect a leader of the new Labour Party. Um, so who were these people? Well, they were a coalition, really, of two groups, to simplify. One were ex-radicals who'd spent their lifetime achieving nothing. This includes me, by the way. Um, and young people who are very idealistic but extremely naive. The older people, I think, uh, their politics are best described by the Duc de la Rochefoucauld in the 18th century as people who'd learnt nothing and forgotten nothing. Um, it applied to the Bourbons, but I think it applies very well to this group of people. They have deep resentments. Um, 
but have really learned nothing about why things didn't work out very well. The young people, on the other hand, are a very different group. But the coalition wasn't completely new. It had already uh, developed during the Stop the War movement against the Iraq War in the United Kingdom, whose success, just like Corbyn's success, was also a great surprise to people. So we have to think a little bit about the politics of this coalition. And I would describe it as a mix of things. It has, on the one hand, a kind of, to use Lenin's expression, a kind of semi-infantile leftism, which means they were unable to credit anybody to the right, particularly Blair, with having achieved anything at all ever. Um, he was a figure of hate, pure and simple. The fact that inequality diminished, that the fact that the welfare state is... Uh, the Iraq war overrode everything. Whatever Blair had done was uh, catastrophic. So there was no serious discussion. And by the way, I was opposed to Blair myself too. So that's one element of it. The second element was anti-imperialism, and particularly anti-Americanism, which was equally unable to credit the West, America, the United Kingdom, Europe, with anything positive at all. And nesting inside that anti-imperialism, anti-Americanism, was a vitriolic anti-Zionism, which saw Israel only through the prism of anti-imperialism and anti-Americanism, and indeed, argues, argued, still argues, that Israel is a creation of the West. So I have a little anecdote for you here. A few years ago, I was teaching a course on, the whole, on genocide, which is something I've written a book about. And um, I was introducing the course. It was actually in Italy, by the way, but it applied, it, I had the same experience in the UK. And I said to the students, well, I'm going to teach you about genocide. We're going to talk about the Holocaust. We'll talk about Rwanda. We'll talk about Yugoslavia. And the students said to me, what about Israel? So I said, what do you mean? And they said, Israel, genocide. I said, okay, fine. We'll, we'll teach the course for a few days, and then it was a week course, and then you can tell me at the end how, where you see the relevance of the, the concept of genocide to Israel. So they're a very good group, and at the end of it I said, so to, to, to tell me, what do you think? And they said, well, Israel is a creation of the West. And I said, when you say it's a creation of the West, what do you mean? And they said, Britain. And I said, what do you mean, Britain? And they said, Britain created Israel. And I said, when? 1948. So I said, well, I think you'll find that's not quite right. Um, actually, Britain didn't vote for a state of Israel in 1948. Oh. America. I said, well, yes, sort of. Go on. <laughs> France. Yes, OK. Go on. OK. I said, well, let me, into it. Let, me let you into a secret. If it hadn't been for arms from the Soviet Union via Czechoslovakia, Israel would never have come into existence. That can't be true, I was told. You're making it up. I said, well, you know. Anyway, so the idea that Israel is a creation of the West is axiomatic uh, in that worldview. But part of that worldview is a selective, a highly selective and reductive form of anti-racism. And we were, I'm very interested in the discussion we just had about racism. I have a slightly different take on it, and I'm sure it'll open up a discussion. What that view of uh, racism involves in the UK on the left and in the Labour Party is that anti-Semitism is not a form of racism today. Or it's not a significant form of racism anyway. And the reason it isn't a significant form of racism is that it can't be because the only significant form of racism is anti-black racism. <laughs> so in the United Kingdom, the conception of racism is located within an, an anti-imperialist frame of reference in which because of the British Empire and colony, there is racism, which there certainly is, and I've been active in anti-racist politics all my life against black people and against people from the Indian subcontinent, but not against Jews. Now, there is no capacity on the left, very little capacity in the UK, for thinking about the complexity of anti-Semitism as a form of racism, but not only as a form of racism, because it's much more complex than that, and I think it's been hinted at in the discussion. And there's no tradition at all in the UK of thinking about anti-Semitism in the way that you find, I think, for example, in Germany. And seeing anti-Semitism as a very profound but complex phenomenon which was, has to be understood in relation to society as a whole, 
and which became genocidal. So although there is this form of anti-racism in the UK, which does recognize the Holocaust, it doesn't think about the Holocaust in terms of anti-Semitism. It, anti it sees racism as a universal problem, but primarily anti-black, and downplays what happened to the Jews in the Holocaust because they were Jews. And it generates a form of understanding of oppression and of genocide in particular, in which Jews somehow get disappeared. Um, and the corollary of that is that it didn't accept, and doesn't accept, especially now, that the state of Israel was a necessity for Jews because of the Holocaust. Because after the Holocaust, in this way of thinking, anti-Semitism is over. It's finished. It's never going to happen again. Um, and it doesn't exist anymore. In fact, Jews have become white. Jews have become a privileged group. Which means that anti not only does anti-Semitism not exist, but that Israel wasn't necessary, and in fact, it turns it on its head. Not only was Israel not necessary, but Israel itself has become a continuation of Nazism and racism in another way. And this, of course, brings us to the idea which is very, very strong in the Labour Party, on the left of the Labour Party, that Zionism is racism. And we talked earlier on this morning about the Durban Conference. And that has become a kind of common sense now in, on the left in the Labour Party. Not the whole of the Labour Party, but in the Labour Party. Uh, and particularly, it's a view held by Corbyn and his closest advisers. Now, the notion that Zionism is a form of racism was never the dominant view in the Labour Party. It was a dominant view on the far left, but not in the Labour Party. And inside the Labour Party, confined to the margins, confined to Corbyn. Now, what's striking is that the group around Corbyn has now come to power. And so their view of racism, their view of Zionism, their view of America, their view of imperialism is now the view of the leadership of the Labour Party. And that is a new phenomenon. But it's worth dwelling for a second on this, which is to look at the history of the notion of Zionism as racism. Because we talked earlier on about the Durban Conference, but actually it has a, a longer prehistory than that. It goes actually back to the Soviet Union and to the Stalinist world. And actually, this may come as a big shock. Every time I mention this to people, and every time I speak about this in a conference, people don't believe me, but believe me, right? Corbyn's two closest advisors are actually Stalinists, by which I mean they think that the demise of the Soviet Union was a disaster. And in one case, they think that North Korea is not such a bad place. I'm not making this up, okay? So we do need to think about how that tradition, which is a Soviet tradition, connected with the anti-colonial anti-racism of the rest of the left, including the liberal left, and so even people who were anti-Stalinist for a long time have converged on this demonization of Israel, which has now become a common sense of the leadership of the Labour Party and all the people who are enthusiastic for other reasons about Corbyn and so forth. So what we have now is what used to be called the socialism of fools, but is probably best described by what Moshe Postoni called the anti-imperialism of fools. Now, there are lots and lots of consequences of this inside the Labour Party, and I'm only going to be, have time to mention a few. One has been an extraordinary softness towards uh, organisations which are openly anti-Semitic, such as Hamas and Hezbollah. And Corbyn and his associates have a long history of inviting representatives of Hamas and Hezbollah to the country and even to Parliament to talk and sitting on platforms where they spout anti-Semitic language, rhetoric, and hatred, and don't challenge it at all, ever. There's no record of them challenging it in these meetings. There is evidence of them ignoring completely, openly anti-Semitic uh, expressions. There was a famous example of a mural painted in East London, which showed Jews in extra, you know, classic Jewish tropes of the Rothschilds controlling the world, and so forth, which Corbyn supported 
and then said he didn't notice the anti-Semitism in it. Um, there are openly masses and masses of examples on social media of openly anti-Semitic expressions uh, by Labour Party members, Labour Party councillors, even Labour Party MPs tweeting and retweeting stuff. There's a famous meeting at which Corbyn was at with a on a Palestinian solidarity meeting where he said that uh, very famously invoked a classic British anti-Semitic stereotype which predates anti-colonialism, anti-Americanism, anti-imperialism and even anti-Zionism in which he said there are Jews in Britain who've been here even a hundred years and they still don't understand English irony. Now this is a kind of classic trope about... Um, about, about Jews in, this, in England. So there's lots and lots of stuff. And it's led to the hounding out of a number of Jewish MPs. And not a day goes by, I mean not a day goes by, where you couldn't go on the web and find more of this stuff. And I say, even in the last three days, right, just before I left the country, come here, a Labour Party MP had been suspended for his view that all this stuff about anti-Semitism was overdone, and the Labour Party had made far too many concessions to Jews, or to the Jewish establishment. And then he was readmitted. And then a couple of days later, 100, over 100 Labour MPs protested about it, so he's now been suspended again. So you have to keep up all the time. So my point about the fact that it's every day is that it's systematic and repeated. And so we have to talk about something that is very significant, and this is where I have a slight disagreement which is the, the importance of racism, in particular institutional racism. Because we have an understanding of the phenomenon of institutional racism in the UK that maybe isn't as shared across the Atlantic. I don't know. It derives from a famous case in the 1980s, which led to a, ma a major inquiry by a, by a justice called McPherson. It led to the McPherson Report on Institutional Racism in the Police Force. And the definition of institutional racism, according to McPherson, which has been adopted, and particularly enthusiastically by the left, is as follows. Institutional racism is the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, cultural, ethnic origin. Now, the importance of this definition is it recognizes that organizations don't have to be full of obvious racists for a discriminatory culture to develop. As it says, racism can also be seen or detected in processes, attitudes, and behavior which amount to discrimination through unwitting, unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness, and racist stereotyping. And this has led people to argue that the Labour Party has become, according to the McPherson definition, an institutionally racist organization. And an organisation that was set up by the Labour Party when Blair was Prime Minister called the Equality and Human Rights Commission has now decided to investigate the Labour Party for institutional racism. Now, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has only ever previously investigated a political organisation for racism on the far right. That tells you the nature of the issue. Now, I don't know what the findings of the Equality and Human Rights Commission are going to be, but the very fact that it has decided to take the case up and investigate the Labour Party is a stunning political development. And I think something is about to shift. I hope. I don't know. And I think you can see this in the debate that took place last year. And again, I want to touch upon something that was mentioned earlier on, which was the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance of definition of anti-Semitism, the IRA definition. Because there was a debate inside the Labour Party about this definition last year. Now, I won't go into too much detail, except to say that the definition of anti-Semitism has been extremely widely adopted in the United Kingdom and indeed across Europe, including by the police force, the Crown Prosecution Service, the Scottish Government, the Welsh Government, and Labour Party councils. Right? So the idea was the Labour Party as a whole would now adopt this definition. Since Labour councils had adopted it, and the government had adopted it, and everybody else seemed to have adopted it. So the definition says, 
that anti-Semitism maybe is a form of hatred towards Jews and gives a series of examples which include, but then it says they're not limited to these, which include accusing Jews as a people or Israel as a state of inventing or exaggerating the Holocaust. Accusing Jew, Isra Jewish citizens of being more loyal to Israel or to the alleged priorities of Jews worldwide than to, interest, than to the interests of their own nation. Denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g. by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is per se a racist endeavor. And drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. But it says, criticism of Israel, similar to that leveled against any other country, cannot be considered as anti-Semitic. And Corbyn and his supporters tried to stop the Labour Party adopting this definition. So it turned out that Corbyn and his committee of supporters do in fact think that Jews exaggerate the Holocaust. They do think that Jews place a particularist loyalty to Israel above the interests of their own nation. They do think that Jews do not have a right to self-determination because they do not form a nation. And they then think it's quite reasonable to compare the Israeli state to the Nazis and to see Zionism as the worst kind of racism, an ideology which has not only led to the appalling crime of apartheid, which is after all now designated as a crime against humanity, but even to genocide, which of course was committed against Jews. So we are in an extraordinary situation. That turned in the end last summer after a furious row, the Labour Party did adopt this definition over Corbyn's wishes. So I think if you have the definition being adopted and you have the Equalities and Human Rights Commission investigating, there clearly is a significant fight back taking place, which wasn't the case a year ago where it seemed you know, such an overwhelming tide. But I think we are obviously in a very serious terrain, and now I want to slightly widen the frame of reference to beyond the Labour Party and beyond the United Kingdom in the spirit of what this conference is about. Because it seems to me that if the Holocaust can get inverted like this, if the gravest charge of all, and it is the gravest charge of all, to accuse a state of being an apartheid state, of committing crimes against humanity, of committing genocide. These are the top crimes in the world. The International Criminal Court puts genocide number one, right? The International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia in Rwanda put genocide number one. The Genocide Convention was developed in 1948, 24 hours before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These are not trivial crimes. They are the number one crimes. So to accuse a state and only one state, because that's the situation, of these crimes puts us in new terrain. So it seems to me whatever the contingent conjunctural reasons which I began with, hatred of Blair, electoral defeats, stop the war, right, whatever those particular conjunctural explanations one would offer, and they're very important ones, clearly, otherwise I wouldn't have wasted your time on them, right? There's something more profound taking place, which has a significance that goes beyond the British context and the Labour Party. It seems to me that we're in a different moment, a different era, in which the Jewish question again has returned. And I'm going to very kindly refer to the book I wrote with my late friend Robert Fine on this. So the Jewish question has become part of the common sense of a significant section of the left. So we're used to anti-Semitism on the right, but we now have anti-Semitism on the left. And I want to make both a distinction between the two and then suggest some openings, if not convergence. So this relates to the very first discussion that Alvin provoked about where anti-Semitism is coming from. Anti-Semitism on the right, we all know about. And the reason we know about it is that anti-Semites on the right say they're anti-Semites. They don't say, I'm not an anti-Semite. They say, I hate Jews, I want to kill them, right? 
Anti-Semites on the left don't say that. They say, we're not anti-Semites. We can't be anti-Semites. As we mentioned earlier, we can't be anti-Semites because we're on the left, because we're anti-racists. So you have a form of anti-Semitism which is distinct to the left, and it's different to that of the right. That's my first point. Now, why is it different? It's different because if you trace the history of modern anti-Semitism, and I'm not talking about eternal invariant anti-Semitism, I'm talking about modern anti-Semitism since the 18th century, the modern world. Anti-Semitism on the right is about, it's a mistake giving Jews rights. It's a mistake emancipating Jews. Everything that's gone wrong is because of the Jews. They brought in democracy, liberalism, socialism, communism, you name it. Modernity, capitalism, everything. Right? And we hate them. We've got to get rid of them. You know, so we can go back to an earlier state of affairs. Anti-Semitism on the left is not about emancipation being a mistake. Anti-Semitism on the left is about Jews failing the test of emancipation. We expected them to enter the modern world, to leave the ghetto and become like us to behave well, to be good citizens, to be members of a nation, not a Jewish nation, and the French Revolution was very clear about it. We're gonna give Jews rights as individuals, not as a nation within a nation. In the Soviet Union, as an extension of this, you assimilate to the Soviet system. If you start going on about being Jewish, we don't wanna hear it. So of course the Holocaust, as what happened to Jews, was systematically repressed in the Soviet Union. So the repeated loyalty of Jews to being Jewish, to their particularism, was something that was unacceptable to a significant section of the left. And that's a different source of anti-Semitism. It's not about emancipation being a bad thing. It's about Jews not behaving well after emancipation. So how does Israel fit into this? Because this is the Jewish question on the left, what the, Jew, what the Jewish question on the left is, we gave Jews rights and they don't behave well. They stick to each other. They're capitalists. They're Zionists. Every other nation state in the world has moved beyond ethnicity and race as a basis of the nation, except for one, the Jewish state. So the rest of us have moved on and become emancipated and modern and democratic and so forth, except for the Jewish state. Now that is about Jews failing the test of emancipation and not behaving as the left wanted them to do and expected them to do. Now, how then can we think about anti-Semitism on the right, which Alvin mostly focused on rightly, and the anti-Semitism on the left. Are they completely distinct animals that have nothing to do with each other? And I don't know the answer to that question. I have some thoughts about it, which is that anti-Semitism is very fluid, it's very elastic, it's open to being picked up. And I think there is a kind of superficial radicalism on the left that is very tempted into anti-Semitism, and there is a long history of it which I could rehearse with you. If you want to, any of you have a problem with sleeping, I can recommend my book. <laughs> Where does this leave us? Well, in the 1980s, an Israeli political scientist, historian called Shulamit Volkov, who some of you may know of, um, suggested that in the 1890s and onwards, anti-Semitism became a kind of cultural code. And I've been pondering partly because she suggested it too in the discussion I had with her and then in some articles, that maybe anti-Semitism is becoming a new a cultural code again in the form of anti-Zionism. It's a possibility. Certainly anti-Semitism, as far as I can see, and this has been my experience in talking about it with people on the left, is not something that's easily discussed in, rational way, in a rational way. You can't provide evidence. 
you can't provide reasoned arguments. My, my little anecdote about those students is a good example. They said, you can't be telling the truth. It's not like I was giving them new evidence. It was that I could, the facts that I was providing them couldn't be facts. To which my response was, well, there might be a problem with a theoretical framework which is on your side, which is generating facts which aren't facts and can't recognize facts which are facts. And we had an interesting discussion about it. Now, the notion that anti-Semitism is a passion is, of course, you know, something that we have thought about before. So that raises the question which we were touching upon in the last session, which I found very, very interesting. And I thought your very cool-headed level-headed analysis was very helpful in many ways. And I think the distinction between intent and outcome is the way I would put it, is a good one. Um, how does one combat a passion? How does one combat an obsession? Well, law can do some things. It can limit the space for the expression of things. And I'm less bothered about free speech than some of my transatlantic friends. Um, because of its impact. The impact of hate speech on people is devastating. I mean, as I know from my work on genocide, and the denial of genocide is a deeply wounding thing for survivors of genocide. So law can do something, but clearly we have to do more than that. And I think we, ha we have to engage in is delegitimation, a politics of delegitimation, of making the expression of anti-Semitic ideas illegitimate in an ethical way. And I do think the debate about the IRA definition and the investigation of the Labour Party for institutional racism are very significant moments in a delegitimation project, conscious or not. So I'll conclude now. I'm cautiously optimistic. I don't think that anti-Semitism uh, is insuperable. I'm surprised, I'm shocked by how fast and how, how fast it's developed. I began thinking about, I mean I have to say, I began thinking about it only after 2000 and 2001 and I never expected it to reach the levels it has reached. And it's grown, Durban was, was, a, was a crucial moment but it's not the only moment. Um, so I, I, when I say I'm cautiously optimistic, people can turn around and say to me, well, you've achieved nothing, so go away. Um, and you've been consistently wrong about everything, which is certainly true. Um, but I'm cautiously optimistic because I think the tide can turn. And I think one can mobilize people against something uh, that is a passion and so irrational. But, and this is the but, we have to look at not just the present, but the past. And for those of us on the left, and I've no idea who I'm talking to here, but I regard myself still as absolutely on the left, we have to look at our own history and understand the moments and periods in which the left has colluded with, facilitated, and condoned anti-Semitism. And that's a long tradition. It's not the only tradition, but it's there. So I think we need to bring the past and the present together. And in fighting anti-Semitism, we need all the resources we have at our disposal. Thank you.